Good to have uh, Freek Winterveen um, give the final talk of this, uh, of this workshop. Freek is going to talk about, um, first of all, Freek recently finished um, PhD in uh, Amsterdam and he's now a postdoc in uh, Copenhagen. Freek is going to talk about uh, random tensor networks with non-trivial links. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jeroen, and uh, you know, very nice to uh, be allowed to speak at this this super nice workshop. Um, and indeed, uh, so the, the title is Random Tensor Networks with Non-Trivial Links, and uh, it's based on a, a joint work with Newton Cheng, Cecilia Lanchin, uh, Geoff Pennington, and Michael Walter. And you can find it on the archive if you're interested. There are all the details uh, and I will um, try to uh, give a bit of an overview of what we did and maybe a bit on the intuitive side. Um, so I hope that's okay for this mathematical audience. And then uh, it, of course we can always go into the details. So I really hope that you ask me lots of questions if something is unclear or you wanna know more or anything. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, the plan for the talk is that I'll start with uh, quite a bit of motivation. Then I want to introduce one uh, technical tool, which we call the replica trick. And I think this is a very useful thing that's also in some other contexts is actually interesting. So I think it's nice to go to it in a little bit of detail. And then I will discuss two results in sort of different regimes. Uh, and one is related to free probability theory. And in the second regime, it's more related to one-shot information theory. So. Random tensor networks with non-trivial links. So you know it, it's it will have some technical meaning in the talk, but uh, random tensor networks also have connections to uh, lots of interesting and quite different uh, things. So, uh, well, a bit unsurprisingly, it's of course related to random matrix theory, and we'll we'll see a little bit of random matrix theory today. Um, it has applications in quantum information theory. It's about quantum states. But maybe more surprisingly, there is also quite a strong connection to quantum gravity. And that's really one of the motivations for the, the work that we did. Um, and, and they're also sort of a, a nice model for studying, in general, chaotic many-body quantum states. So uh, I think random tensor networks are sort of a very interesting object to study. And um, in this talk, I will uh, first you know, give a little bit of motivation for you know, what uh, some of these connections actually. So um, let me start by saying what is a tensor network. And I think that this slide is somewhat redundant at this point in the, in the conference, but I still wanna you know, very briefly say it. So um, a tensor is just you know, some object in a tensor product of um, vector spaces. And uh, we think of it as um, something having indices and it's just a bunch of numbers with these indices, and it, uh, we we maybe think of it as a we typically think of it as a quantum state. And um, what we uh, do is that we draw these tensors as sort of blobs with legs, and then each of the legs represents uh, one of the indices. And if we have two blobs, uh, then we can uh, connect some of the legs if the legs have the same dimensions, and we can. Uh, uh, sum over the the internal index, and, and that's a contraction. So that's, and then I kind of have a whole, a whole bunch of tensors, and they contract uh, as some network to uh, a new tensor. This is something we have seen quite extensively, I think, in this uh, in this workshop. So I I hope it's clear. But I mean, if, if something is not clear, you should of course interrupt. So um, yeah, so this is the picture that we have in mind. Uh, we have a, a whole collection of uh, tensors, and uh, we have some graph uh, along which we connect some of these tensors. And at each of these uh, edges in my uh, in my graph, there is a bond dimension, so which is the the dimension of the Hilbert space along along that edge, which I typically call capital D. And uh, in this talk, what we will do is we will choose each of these tensors randomly and independently of each other, and then look a little bit at the properties of the resulting objects. So um, I've drawn, uh, so, so, yeah. The graph is fixed, uh, the graph structure you fix. Yeah, so the, the graph structure we fix, and I think it's also good to mention something here is that, that uh, if, if, for instance, if you do uh, PEPs, uh, as, as in the talk of David yesterday, then typically what you have is this, um, you have this lattice-like structure 
and there is a, a sort of a physical dimension at each side, at each tensor. But I think here, I, what I want, to, what I have in mind more is that um, maybe there's also there could also be lots of uh, tensors that actually don't have any physical dimensions, which are just internal. And and for bookkeeping purposes, uh, what we do is that we all the places where we have a tensor, we call bulk vertices. And at all the ends of sort of the legs that are still dangling, so where the, the resulting tensor actually lives, there we also place uh, uh, a sort of a, a vertex, which you call a boundary vertex. So then uh, in the bulk vertices, vertices are these uh, tensors, which are in the end contracted and the resulting object sort of lives on the boundary vertices. But I mean, this is really just a, a bookkeeping tool. To keep track of the system. So I could think of the red vertices as having vari like variable tensors in them or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want, yeah, like if you you could think of the, them the, yeah, that that's one way to see it, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, and so if we do this construction, we fix the graph and then you know pick random tensors, then we have what we call a random tensor network. And that's what we're going to study in this talk. So um I want to come to a little bit on a, a different way to uh, to actually make to to think of these tensor networks, and it was already uh, very nicely uh, discussed in Alessandra's talk, I think, or in a slightly different language. But that uh, we actually take uh, the graph that we have and we place maximally entangled states on each of the edges of the graph, uh, and and this is what is called what was called the graph tensor, I think, in Alessandra's talk, if I remember correctly. And then uh, what we may do is we, at each of the, the vertices, of the bulk vertices, we pick some tensor, which I, I do know it here by uh, psi sub v for the vertex v. And then I project onto uh, this, uh, vert onto this uh, tensor at that side. And I do uh, nothing on the uh, boundary vertices. And then the resulting object is an object that lives on the boundary vertices. And this is the uh, the tensor network state. So actually this construction is why they are called projected entangled pair states. Okay, so that's, it's the very same thing. Um, so one thing, and, and okay, what's, what's called the graph state, I call it the, the link state at each of the, each of the edges, there are some, some states and we put a maximum entangled state there, but we can also put, you know, some other pure state there. Um, and let's say that it's, and it, it has some Schmidt decomposition uh, with, with some coefficients. And, um, and then we can do the very same construction, but now we don't start with this maximum entangled state, we start with, with some other states. And I should say that you know, from a purely uh, tensor network uh, theory perspective, maybe this is not so super interesting because uh, we might as well uh, encode this into the tensors, right? We can just move these coefficients that I put on the on the maximum entangled states, I can just also put them in the tensors. So it's not really a different ansatz, but of course it will make a difference uh, once we take these random tensors. So I like to think of it as having these non-trivial links and then taking uniformly random tensors, but you can also think of it as having the usual thing with maximum entangled states and then having tensors maybe where you allow the distribution of the tensors to be a little bit skewed in some way. So now I want to say something about various motivations for this model. And, and one motivation is very exotic, I think. It's a holographic quantum gravity. So I will be pretty brief about this because it's maybe not, uh, it's very physics-y and a bit complicated and I also don't know it so well. Um, so um, in uh, the study of quantum gravity, uh, people have come up with the fascinating idea that uh, gravitational theories are secretly uh, one dimension lower than they look. So sort of our universe, you know, you should really think of it not as a three dimensional universe, but secretly as some two dimensional thing that lives on a huge sphere at infinity. Very uh, sort of, uh, uh, this is not completely correctly said, but that, that's sort of the idea that, that physicists have. So, and, and there is sort of precise version which is not um, uh, on, on cer in certain types of cosmology, which is called ADS-CFT, where uh, the, the space is a hyperbolic space and then uh, the boundary has some specific type of quantum theory. Okay, so there, the, the, but the point is 
that there is a, a d plus one dimensional gravity uh, theory, which is the bulk. And then on the boundary of the space, there is a d-dimensional normal quantum theory, no gravity. This is a very uh, exotic phenomenon, and hopefully this will help us understanding uh, quantum gravity better also in, in, you know, in the real world. Um, and, um, I, and, and, and one, uh, so the, the way this, this holographic uh, quantum gravity often proceeds is that you want to understand uh, what are uh, things, how, how are things related in these two theories, right? If I have something that's like some phenomenon in gravity, there should be some corresponding phenomenon in the boundary quantum theory and vice versa. So there is some sort of uh, dictionary between boundary and bulk, uh, or no, boundary quantum theory, bulk gravity theory. And um, you know, one interesting phenomenon that was observed at some point by uh, Rio and Takianagi is that uh, if we look at entanglement entropy in the uh, boundary, then this has a nice uh, corresponding, uh, corresponding quantity in the bulk. So if we, we take some uh, subsystems, so now I, I look from the top, this is just uh, space, and you should think of the, this uh, disk as the hyperbolic disk, uh, if you want. And, uh, and we, we look at some, uh, some subsystem uh, A here, and we look at the, uh, at the state, we look at the reduced density matrix, and we compute its, uh, its von Neumann entropy. Then uh, the claim from these quantum gravity people is that uh, this is alternatively computed by looking uh, at the gravity theory at the bulk, and looking at all surfaces which uh, separate A from its complement in the boundary, right? So there are many surfaces I can draw. And amongst these surfaces, I take uh, the, the minimal uh, one, the one of minimal area, and uh, the, the area of this surface actually computes the entanglement entropy, something that, uh, that people came up with. And um, this has been extended a lot and sort of very loosely speaking, you could say there is a, a slogan that boundary entanglements responds to uh, bulk geometry. So there's, there's some sort of very close relationship between uh, gravitational geometry and, uh, and, and entanglement in, in certain uh, theories. And this is of course a very mysterious phenomenon and random tensor networks are a very, very simple toy model to, to understand such a correspondence. Like what, what does that even mean? So what, what I claim, and that's maybe not so, not so surprising is that actually the entanglement properties of the random tensor network states will be encoded in the geometry of the graph. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this idea was uh, first explored by, uh, in, in a paper by uh, Patrick Hayden and many co-authors. And they looked at this random tensor network uh, model and they took a large uh, bond dimensions to be able to analyze the model. And in some way, this is also natural if you compare to the, the holographic gravity setting. And, um, and what you find is that if you look at a subsystem A of the boundary and we want to compute its uh, entropy, it's actually, uh, we can look at all the cuts in the network that separate A from its complements, right? So I drew one here, a purple one, uh, uh, the, the, the blue one. And we can, amongst all these cuts, we can look at the smallest one. So the one where I have to uh, cut sort of as few vertices as possible to separate A from its complements. And then the claim is that the entropy of, uh, of the states uh, row A, the reduced state row A, is approximately given by log D times the size of the minimum cuts. This is not very surprising in a way, because if you, um, an, an upper bound is sort of almost trivial, and this is maybe very clear to this audience actually, uh, if, I, uh, if I look at this whole object as a tensor, then it's clear that uh, every cut gives a rank upper bound uh, on the, uh, on, on, on row A. So it's, it's easy to see that the, the rank of row A is less or equal to uh, D to the power uh, gamma A. So the number of things I cut to separate A from its complements 
uh, and, and in particular, this is true for the minimum class. So, uh, and, and this implies an upper bound on the entropy. And conversely, uh, if we take random tensors, then perhaps it's also not very surprising that this upper bound is actually saturated. It turns out that it does. And we'll, we'll see uh, why later in the talk. Okay. So that was uh, one motivation. Oh, yeah, okay. So I want to make one comment on this. So um, a shortcoming of random tensor net network models is that, you know, of course, they don't, they're not a theory of gravity. And one thing that's particularly unrealistic when you look at the entanglement structure is that um, if you look at the Renyi entropies of the of reduced state, then uh, they're all the same. So the Renyi entropy is is they're sort of computed from the uh, from the the moment uh, of the of the states, or in other words, um, the state that you get uh, is essentially maximum angle between A and its complement. And in in uh, holography, typically there is actually some dependence on on, on K here, so it's not exactly maximum entangled. But there's like some non-trivial spectrum. So that's that's one motivation for actually introducing these these spectra on the link states. Um, and um, a nice uh, one one phenomenon where you can really uh, see that something something different happens. Is uh, if in uh, if there is a phase transition in which um, surface is actually the minimal surface. So that in in some situations there is a point where, given your boundary region, there are actually uh, two surfaces which are the minimal surface. And a nice example is this one. Uh, here we have a boundary region which consists of two disjoint regions, and um, well. If you think about it, uh, you uh, maybe not so strange that's, that actually these two uh, different surfaces that I, I drew here, like either the one where I, uh, you know, either uh, this one here or uh, so, so this, uh, these, these uh, surfaces, um, that these have the same uh, size for certain choices of A. And if I make A a little bit bigger, then uh, maybe this one gets dominant. And if I make A a little bit smaller, then uh, this one becomes dominant. So, um, and, and these two really have uh, very different properties. Like they're, the one is connected, like, sorry, the, yeah, in the, yeah the, these, these are some, somewhat uh, different. And um, the fact that you have these two surfaces also gives uh, corrections to the value of the entropy. And these values are really different if you just do it in a random tensor network or in uh, the gravitational setting. And we show that if you put in these non-trivial link states in the right way, you can actually get the, the right corrections. So, so it's really useful to do so if you uh, are interested in random tensor networks as a toy model for holographic entropies. Okay, that was motivation one. Now a little bit of a less exotic uh, motivation which is uh, just entanglement of random states. So um, a very reasonable and natural question is that if you uh, pick a random state, and let's say it's a pure state on A, B, and C, um, and I pick this state just uniformly at random, you know, is the state row A, B entangled? Or, or does it, like, what is the value of certain entanglement measures on this random state? It's a very interesting question, and it's, it depends on how the dimensions of A, B, and C scale together. There are very interesting phase transitions between uh, entangled versus separable states or uh, between PPT states versus non-PPT states. And uh, there are a number of people such as uh, Guillaume Aubron and Ion Nishita who have uh, worked on this extensively and have derived very interesting results. Um, I want to mention like the most basic example that's, uh, you know, not so, uh, that, that's very well known, which is if I just have a pure state on two systems, A and B, and I pick a random state and I want to know what is uh, the entropy of the A system, let's say. So uh, in this case, um, we can really think of this as sort of a baby example of the random tensor network story where I have uh, two potential uh, minimal cuts, uh, one here and one here separating A from its complement B. 
And uh, then the, uh, the entropy is given by the minimum of uh, either sort of uh, the one cut or the, the other cuts. And uh, indeed, you can, you can show that with high probability, this is approximately true. So if, uh, if, the, if, the local, if the dimensions dA and dB B are sufficiently large. So this is a very basic and, and well-known example. Um, and there is sort of an interesting question, uh, or there's sort of, it's sort of interesting to look at the case where uh, uh, the dimension of A and B are actually equal. So this is sort of this phase transition where there are now actually two minimal cuts. And uh, one way to see, uh, you, you can see in, in very much detail what actually happens at this phase transition. Um, it's, uh, we know that the entropy is approximately log D and we know that the state is approximately maximally entangled. So all of the eigenvalues are uh, approximately uh, of the order uh, one over D. And uh, if we, um, essentially make a histogram of the eigenvalues and we rescale them by this factor of D. So it's an order one number. Um, so this, this object here is the, um, this object here is the empirical measure. I just put a, a Delta peak at each rescaled um, eigenvalue. Uh, and if we let uh, D go to infinity, then we actually find that, that this object here, this measure, that it converges to a nice continuous uh, distribution. And it's, it's the Machenko Pasteur distribution. This is a very well known result. And so, so we understand, so for a large D, we understand very well how this, this spectrum looks at, like at the phase transition. And this also gives some order one correction to the, to the entropy, actually. Oops. Okay, and uh, yeah, so so this is another motivation that we want to understand uh, this behavior where we see that actually entanglement theory for random states is closely related to uh, interesting random matrix theory uh, because it's Marchenko Pasteur distribution. That's the fact that this is the case, it's in fact from random matrix theory. Uh, and, and we want to extend this random matrix theory to the setting of tensor network. Okay, then um, a third motivation is. Uh, quantum information, uh, and, and in particular, multi-party quantum information. So um, I just uh, recall for you that you know, the, the setting that we had is we, we had this, uh, this graph, we had boundary and bulk vertices. We started with this all these uh, states and edges, and then we project onto some tensors in the bulk, okay? And one way to uh, think of this is that it's the post measurement state of some measurements. Uh, in particular, you can think of it as the, the post measurement state of a random measurement. So um, uh, everyone in the bulk, and let me call everyone in the bulk Charlie now because we're doing quantum information theory. Everyone in the bulk is a random measurement and, and you know, gets some outcome and then the state gets projected onto this, uh, this random state. So, um, Understanding what this post measurement state looks like is really helpful in, in certain multi party quantum information uh, protocols where uh, random measurements are typically actually optimal uh, for certain tasks. So you can think of tasks where uh, the boundary is partitioned in uh, Alice and Bob, and uh, in the book we have Charlie, and Charlie can do uh, LOCC with Alice and Bob, and they, uh, they want to do some tasks. So, for instance, uh, they want to, so earlier work by uh, Patrick Hayden and Andrew Thiel um, has, has sort of used the same IDs to uh, do a task called split transfer in, in such networks, where uh, Charlie wants to redistribute the state to Alice and Bob, and like part of the state of Charlie goes to Alice, and part of the state goes to Bob, and in what ways can they do this? So, uh, and, and the computations that you have to do in order to understand these protocols they are really random tensor network computations. Okay, this is um, this that was the, the motivation for studying this object. And now I want to go to the, the technical tool that we, we use, which is the replica trick. And this was also uh, worked out by Hayden et al. in their in the first random tensor network paper. So um, you know, I have this, this formula again here for the, the random tensor network states. 
And um, now I wanna be a little bit more precise about what do I actually mean when I say random? Well, um, this, uh, these, these uh, tensors at each, uh, at each side, they are really just, uh, it's just a list of numbers. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna choose these numbers uh, as IID uh, complex uh, Gaussian numbers. So uh, what I mean that this is we take, you know, just some, some complex numbers and X and Y are IID uh, Gaussians with, uh, you know, mean zero and variance one. And we do this for uh, all the tensors and, and that gives us the random tensors that we need. And um, also uh, I wanna sort of point out here that it's, it's helpful to actually not just look at the pure state, but to, uh, to, look, to sort of put the, the bra and the cats together. And then um, by cyclicity of the trace, we may uh, move around uh, some things and we get to this formula here. So, I mean, this, this formula here, I, I wanna emphasize is really just, uh, yeah, it's really just the same thing where I organize things a little bit differently. I, I take sort of the, so let's unpack it a little bit here. Uh, we have the, the state on all the links, the link state or the graph state, or whatever. And, um, and now I apply on, the, on each of the, of the vertices, I apply the, the projector and I trace out all the uh, bulk vertices and that gives me some state living on the boundary. And then that's the random tensor network state. So um, we're gonna do something called the replica trick and it consists of two very simple uh, observations. So the first observation is that, is that we, uh, is, is a trick to compute uh, powers of a matrix. And um, the, the idea is as follows, uh, we can also, instead of uh, you know, computing this nonlinear function of row, we can also take K copies of row and um, computes uh, the trace of k copies of row rows together with uh, a cyclic permutation. So it's it's not so hard to see. If you do this, you uh, you precisely you know get the trace of the product of k copies of row. So that's that's one observation, and um, and and the, the reason, of course, that if we want to understand the the spectrum of, of of some density of this reduced density matrix on, on a subsystem. So uh, if we understand you know, the, the trace of the kth power for all k, then we also understand the spectrum. And the second observation, so we, we have sort of these k tensor powers, and then uh, the also k tensor powers of the random state will show up. And if we, uh, we take, this uh, Gaussian random states, we take uh, K tensor powers and we take the expectation value uh, of this object. Uh, what we get is uh, we get a sum over all the permutations uh, over K elements. So to be clear, right, this, this object here, uh, it lives uh, the, the K tensor product of, of Psi, it's, it's a linear operator on K copies of the space it lives initially on. And uh, these, op these operators here, they are just the operators that permute these copies according to the given uh, permutation. Okay, uh, if one of these two things is not clear, you should certainly interrupt me now. That's a good point. Is something missing on the last slide? Like it says sum over pi pi? Uh, uh, it should be a- maybe. Mm. Like a... Maybe you don't see my full screen or something. I uh, is does this? Yeah. Or... Yeah, I see. Yeah. Mm. Ah, because it's an operator. Ah, that's the expected operator is the sum of the permutations. Exactly. Exactly. So and yeah, and also the second property is by the way, it's also just a very uh, simple consequence of of Schur's lemma. Mm. So now let's do this replica trick. So we have these two ingredients. I'm keeping there so we can remember them. Uh, and we, we have our graph, uh, we have a boundary subsystem. And you know, let me just abstract it to this picture for convenience. We have some 
bow graph, and we have some boundary vertices, and we have a, a subsystem. So um, what we're going to do is we want to uh, compute uh, the, uh, the trace of rho a to the power k. Once we know this for OK, we understand the spectrum of rho a. And uh, we're going to compute the expectation values of these objects. And actually, uh, these will concentrate. So that, that will be good. And uh, by the first ingredient, we can just uh, take k copies of the state and multiply with this cyclic permutation operator and, and take the expectation value. And um, because the state uh, row A is just defined as the partial trace over uh, A complements, uh, we can also think of this as we take just the full pure uh, state and we multiply with the identity on A complement and with the cyclic permutation on A, then and, and we trace over it. And that, that gives the same results. Okay, um, so scary looking formula, but it's really just, uh, we just fill in the definition of this uh, random tensor network state, right? Uh, we, we had this random tensor network state and there uh, we had the, the link state that we started with, which we have now K copies of. Uh, then we have the, uh, the bulk uh, random state at each vertex, which we now also have K copies of. And um, we still have on the, uh, yeah, on the boundaries to have these permutations that we apply and we uh, trace over the, the bulk to get the random tensor network state. And then we also trace over the boundary because we are tracing over the, the whole thing. And um, now it is time to use the second ingredient, which is just that uh, this uh, object here, uh, we can, this is the only random thing and we compute the ex expectation value. And it's, it gives me a sum over permutations and, and at each side, these permute the, the, the Hilbert spaces that correspond to that vertex. So, um, and, and now we just, this is the, the expression that we need. And now we just need to do some, think a little bit about what it actually uh, means. So one thing we can do is we can just take this uh, sum that's that's over here. We take it out of the, uh, out of the whole expression. And we have this, this product uh, over all of the vertices. So that means that if we take the sum out, um, we're going to sum over all configurations of um, sort of assignments of a permutation to each bulk vertex. Okay. So that's here we have this, this object here. And this just means that we, we sum over all possibilities to, um, to assign to any vertex some permutation in SK. And um, here I sort of, we, we can actually now, and uh, we have the bulk vertices where we have an arbitrary permutation, but we also have the boundary vertices where we also applied some permutation, right? Either uh, the cyclic permutation or the identity. So we can think of it as we have some configuration, all permutations, but where we have uh, some boundary conditions. You know, it has to be uh, the cyclic permutation in A, and it has to be the identity permutation on the complement of A. And then anything in the book. Um, yeah, so now we just have to understand uh, what this uh, what this this object here, given some configuration, what it looks like, um, and and then we can think of this uh, this whole object that we computed as a sort of a spin model, uh, where it's a it's sort of a statistical mechanics model where on, on each vertex uh, we assign a spin, which is now a permutation, uh, and then it's it computes some value. And we will see that in appropriate regime, um, we can uh, understand this spin model well. So um, we have here this, uh, this tensor product over all the vertices and uh, we have these permutations and now we multiply with these maximum, with these uh, pure states on the links. And uh, we can take that down into a, um, a product over all of the edges. And uh, at each edge, we get uh, just this, uh, this object that we have to compute. And now we, um, okay, so one thing we can do is we can actually, uh, if you think about this a little bit, and this is, this is not very uh, complicated, but I don't want to uh, derive it right now. 
this only depends on uh, pi inverse uh, at, of, of v times uh, pi w. And the key thing is that you know, by the very same sort of ingredient one of the replica trick, uh, we, we, we see that this permutation, it's a combination of a couple of cycles. And uh, let me call the, the, the collection of lengths of those cycles. I call uh, the, it's the cycle type uh, of this particular cycle. And then um, we precisely compute uh, powers of the spectrum of this, uh, of the matrix that's, that's on, the, uh, on the edge. Okay, so that's, that's maybe a little bit much to, uh, to parse in one go, but um, um, it's, I should really say that we have this, this permutation um, and uh, we, uh, it, has, it has a number of cycles and each of these cycles contributes um, a, a, a trace to the power, uh, the length of that cycle. Now, to, to get an idea of what this means, let's assume that we have something that's, that is maximally entangled or which is almost maximally entangled. So it's, we have some states and the, uh, these coefficients lambda here, they're order of magnitude one over the bond dimension. And um, if we compute the, uh, compute uh, some uh, lambda to the power n, uh, we have you know, one over d to the power n, and from the from summing we have d terms, so uh, it's d to the power one minus n. In other words, for each of these, uh, for each edge here, uh, we get um, we get sort of d to the power um, sum over n one minus n. Uh, in other words, uh, if I, uh, and, and I can now um, take uh, the, uh, the product of the edges and make it into uh, an exponential of a sum over the logarithms. That's not important, but it's just to, to organize a little bit what it looks like. And so it looks more like a, a spin model in case you've, you, you're familiar with that. Then what we see is that we get a sum over configurations subject to uh, certain boundary conditions where each configuration is uh, weighted by an exponential uh, where we uh, sum over all the edges and on each of the edges we sort of have um, we look at the uh, the edge the, the permutations that are on both sides of the edge and we uh, we compute this oh, sorry, it's a bad color and we compute this uh, this quantity here. So this is a little bit like, uh, or, yeah. So th this you should think of as the uh, the energy uh, on edge uh, E. And um, if the energy is very large, then uh, sort of its contribution is very suppressed because log, and also because we assume that D is very. If we assume that D is very large, then log d is large, so it's very suppressed. So we somehow need to find um, configurations which have small energy. And um, maybe sort of keeping with this spin model picture, each configuration you can see as it's, it's an assignment of permutations to the vertices, and there are sort of domains corresponding to different uh, vertices. And if we have two um, vertices next to each other, which are the same, then uh, we get the identity here, and then uh, this uh, just gives uh, you know the this here uh, just gives me uh, a one, so it's it doesn't contribute anything. Whereas um, if they are very different, uh, then it will suppress it by you know some factors of d. So um, so the how much something contributes is really only determined by the boundaries um, between the different regions with different spins. If you're a physicist, maybe you think of them as sort of domain walls. And along these domain walls, uh, we have this, uh, this contribution. And uh, maybe you're familiar with this, this is something uh, called the 
it's actually the Cayley distance uh, between uh, these two permutations. So let's look at uh, the particular case where there is a unique minimal cut. Um, let's think about what, uh, what, what sort of the model wants intuitively. It is, it wants to have uh, things next to each other which are equal. Those have low energy. So, uh, and, but on the boundary, we have a region where we have the cyclic permutation, we have a region where we have the identity permutation. So uh, that suggests that sort of from these boundary inwards, it's the model kind of wants to, you know, stick to these boundary conditions, but of course, at some point they have to clash and they better uh, clash at the point where uh, they sort of clash as little as possible. So at the minimal uh, way to separate A from A bar. And um, yeah, it's not so hard to show that indeed, uh, if there, if you have a unique minimal cut, then the there's only one configuration, namely this one, where I fill up with the cyclic permutation on the one side and the identity on the other side, which uh, gives me sort of the, the main contribution and all other configurations are down by power D. So that means we can approximate the value of uh, this expectation here by this one configuration uh, of permutations. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and these uh, are really only determined by uh, the link states along this cut. And the rest of the network is, is not seen. Okay, that was uh, this, this replica trick essentially. And uh, I now wanna discuss one of our, uh, our results, uh, which is sort of a, um, mostly about the, the case where there's not a unique minimal cut, but there are actually two minimal cuts. And we see that there are some more subtle um, random matrix theory ideas that, that sort of come in a very nice way. So this, this generalizes this case with one tensor where we had equal dimensions on both sides. So there, what we saw was that, uh, you know, we also here, we, we know that the eigenvalues of uh, row A, they are gonna be of uh, this order because that's the, the amount of, uh, that's actually the rank and it's more or less maximally entangled. And we wanna study the fluctuations around this order of magnitudes. So what we're gonna do is we're uh, gonna uh, rescale the, uh, the eigenvalues of uh, row A by, by this factor and uh, look at the empirical distribution. So it's sort of, you should think of it as a histogram again. And, uh, and, and similarly, we also scale, uh, we, and so yeah, which is, I did not, uh, we're also gonna assume that uh, the, uh, the spectrum of the uh, link states is sort of also around uh, one over D, but with some fluctuations around it. So. And these fluctuations, they are also captured by uh, a measure. And we assume that this converges as we let D go to infinity. So in the case, there are two minimal cuts. Um, and, and let's suppose there are exactly two minimal cuts. Then um, we can again look at the spin model. And it turns out that now there are some extra configurations that are sort of as good as, right there. I mean, there are two configurations we could immediately single out. Um, because there are just two that we, we can fill in with tau on the one side and with identity on the other side, but there are two minimal cuts, so there are two ways to do it. But actually, there is also some other uh, possibilities where you look at the region in between, and there you uh, put some permutations pi, which are such that um, the, the energy or the Cayley distance from uh, tau to pi and then from uh, pi to identity is the same as the energy in just directly going from tau to the identity. So these configurations will also have the same energy. And um, in, in order of uh, D. So now if we uh, compute the, uh, the expectation value of the kth moment, then we see that we actually sum over all these uh, possibilities for the middle as well 
um, like these are all different configurations. And then uh, we have the, uh, here uh, we have the moments uh, of the, uh, along the, the edges in the minimal cuts, right? So this is what I earlier wrote just as sum over lambda i to the power n. And now there are some combinations. So let's let's have a little bit uh, of a further look at this this formula. Uh, what are actually these uh, permutations that we can put in the middle? So they are uh, the the non-crossing partitions, and they they're very well known in both in combinatorics and in and in matrix theory they occur a lot. And how do we get them? Well, you you put your numbers one to k on a on a circle, and you you know you draw you you put them together in groups and you have to be able to do this in such a way that this diagram that i drew here has no crossings and then associated to that there is in a natural way a permutation so this gives me a, a whole set of permutations and those are the permutations that i'm allowed to put in between and now uh, we see that uh, the the moments that occur in this formula they are sort of um, here we have these two. Uh, so we look at the, the cycle type of, of pi itself. So, you know, in this case, it's uh, four, two, three, three. And then uh, we also look at the cycle type of uh, when we uh, multiply it with this uh, cyclic permutation. And uh, this also gives me a couple of numbers and these moments alone uh, the the two minimal cuts, those we sort of combine. So we get some weird combinatorial object that computes uh, the trace of uh, row a to the power k. Unfortunately, um, this is something that has been studied very extensively by random matrix theory uh, experts. And uh, we actually recognize in these expectation value here, we recognize the expectation values of uh, a certain free products. So, um, what we uh, uh, so what we get to be precise is we we take the spectrum of the eigenvalues um, along the first minimal cuts, along the second minimal cuts, and we take a Marchenko Pasteur distribution, which I very loosely sketched, and we take the free product of these two uh, distributions. That gives me another distribution. And that's uh, the answer. And uh, what is this free product, which is, you may have never seen before? Um, well, you can loosely think of it as the spectrum of a product of independent random matrices. So um, let's uh, make it a little bit more precise. So if we have uh, two distributions, which take values on uh, positive numbers, then um, we could, uh, we may, how do, how do we construct the something that is distributed according to the free product approximately? Well, we make, we take two uh, diagonal matrices and we sample their eigenvalues from mu and nu, but then um, we put one of them in just a different basis. So we apply a random unitary. And then uh, if we look at the product of these two things, well, that's, that need not be a Hermitian operator. But uh, if we um, write it like, like this, then it's, it is a nice Hermitian or actually positive operator. And, um, and this object has a spectrum which, um, as we let the dimension of the matrices increase, converges to this free product. So it is in some sense a general, it is in some sense a generalization of um, independent random variables to non-commuting random variables. And, the way you should think of it a bit loosely here in this context also is that uh, each of the regions in the random tensor network, uh, so the, the red region is sort of like a random uh, isometry, uh, the, uh, the green region is sort of like a random unitary, and then the blue region is again sort of a random isometry. And that makes this free product very natural in this. Um, so this is a nice computation. We, understand the entanglement structure of these random tensor network states better now. And as a sort of 
uh, fun side application. This also means that we can actually use ideas from uh, free probability theory for certain uh, computations in holographic uh, gravity. So that, that's an interesting connection. Um, I guess I have five-ish minutes. So I'll say something very briefly about the, the second uh, regime, which is more related to one-shot information theory. So in uh, the in the first regime, we, we really need to assume that, okay, maybe we did not have maximum entangled state, but something a little bit close to it. And um, another simple thing you could think of is that you just start with some initial qubit state and you take many tensor uh, products of it. And then you get uh, a nice state as well. But uh, in that case, we see that the, the resulting state is actually pretty far from maximally entangled and, and the spectrum really ranges uh, from, you know, if we have some, if we start with this state, which has uh, probability P on zero, zero and one minus P on one, one, then the spectrum really ranges over a big uh, range. So that the, the previous results are certainly do not apply. And um, one way to deal with this is with um, using more ideas from information theory. And, um, so um, we know that if we have a probability distribution, then we can compress it asymptotically at the rate of the entropy, famous result by Shannon, of course. And probably many people here will also know a little bit about, perhaps know about uh, one-shot information theory, where the question is, what if I want to compress a single copy of a distribution? So uh, as an example question. So, uh, let's say I have this distribution and I want to compress it, but I don't want to make any error. Well, then I can uh, only, I can just discard all of the outcomes, uh, which anyways have zero probability. And if I do that, then I won't make any error and that's the best I can do. So the, the rate at which I can compress with zero error is just the number of outcomes, which have, it's, it's just sorry, the, the logarithm of the number of outcomes uh, which uh, over the number of outcomes which do not, uh, which are not zero. And, uh, and similarly, quantum mechanically, we can perfectly compress at uh, the, the logarithm of the rank of rho so we can, without losing anything. But this is kind of an interesting, of course, and uh, typically we want to allow a little bit of an error if we do this one shot, uh, this, this type of one shot information processing tasks. And if I allow um, if I allow uh, epsilon error, then uh, what I uh, can do I can just uh, discard a few small probabilities, and I should not discard, and I should discard as small as possible so that they sum up to something which is at most epsilon, and then I make error at most epsilon. Quantum mechanically, uh, you can um, similarly look at sort of nearby density matrices, for instance, the trace norm. And then uh, you try to find the one which has in the neighborhood, which has the lowest rank. And um, so a, a complicated version of this, and you know, don't look at the formula if you don't know it, is the, uh, the min relative entropy and it's smoothed version. So, I mean, there is some, uh, some quantity here and it's, it generalizes the, uh, the conditional entropy in a nice way for many uh, information processing tasks. And um, so back to random tensor networks, if we, if we have these arbitrary link states, then actually it's, it's already quite unclear what the minimal cuts uh, now even means. Like I can look at the graph and I can count, the, I look at the cut, which has the minimal number of edges, but it could be that, you know, on these edges, there are sort of actually very big states in, in some way, or that there are maybe other edges where there are very, um, uh, where there are sort of lower dimension states. So you have to think carefully about what this, this minimal cut even means. And uh, in, the, in the maximally entangled state uh, case, we can, uh, sort of one way to measure this in a sort of redundant way is to just look at the entropy, which just counts uh, is, is just given by log d times the uh, the number of edges that are crossed. So I look at the entropy, of the shaded region until the cut, and then if I compute the entropy of the of the link state of that region, 
it just counts how many uh, edges were cut by a factor of log d. In other words, if the if I have some, and if I want to say that the state is is minimal, if the cut is minimal, then I have to uh, compare different entropies. And as you can imagine, this is precisely this difference of and a certain difference of entropies has to be positive. Um, and uh, this then translates to a uh, smooth min entropy um, condition that turns out to be the sort of the, the good condition for uh, tensor networks with arbitrary link states. And uh, yeah, so we, we prove that this condition indeed leads to uh, the desired type of result where you can approximate the spectrum of, of rho, uh, but I, I won't. And it's again the replica trick which which proves it in in some sense like a version of this, and and finally we also use this to to study in cases that look like uh, I have many copies of a single state uh, to actually compute corrections to the entanglement entropy if there are two minimal services, and and in this case so the 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 entropy is order uh, n if we have n copies. And the, the, the corrections to it are order square root n. And this is uh, quite similar to, um, to finite order corrections to, for instance, there, there are also square root n uh, order corrections to compression rates. Uh, if you do usual information theory, and these are also the type of corrections we, we find here. Okay, then I'll end here because I think my time's up. All right, thanks. Nick. Are there any questions? I thought this this free probability I've never used it um, and I was wondering like what are its good pro its, its good properties like if you compare it to for example just a tensor product uh, what are its its good product uh, its good properties yeah um, well I mean it's it's really just a different thing it's it's a bit more complicated in a way it's it also it, it's so i i sort of introduced it here a little bit in a um not so clean way saying as oh it's the the object that you get when you do some convergence with uh, large random matrices but there is also really a nice clean algebraic theory uh, when you sort of study um non-commutative probability theory, and you can uh, look at non-commuting random variables. So you have a C star algebra with uh, with some state on it, and you look, then, then there are some conditions under which you can say what this free independence mean. And in that framework, uh, also uh, the free product and the free sum are, uh, are defined. And um, so th there is a really nice algebraic theory for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if that maybe doesn't really answer your question, but it's... yeah. <laughs> so the replica trick was uh, an existing tool or yeah, so this replica trick was, was an existing tool. It, it's it's anyways, I think, um also before this random tensor network paper by by Hayden et al. I think there this ID um in all kinds of random matrix models is is uh, well known, I think. And it's, for instance, also something that you would use if you want, or a variation of it you could use to analyze random circuits. Uh, so in that sense, it's a very uh, versatile tool, right? Because a random circuit is also in some sense a sort of special case of a random tensor network. So very similar the techniques. Random quantum circuits, you mean, right? Random quantum circuits. With yeah. Like random unitaries. Uh, yeah, so you, you pick some structure and then you pick each gate, some random unitary. Yeah, that's that's a type of model that you can analyze with with similar methods. And there has been really a lot of interest over the last couple of years to to analyze those type of models. Mm. Yeah, you can also map to some different, more complicated statistical mechanics model and analyze that. And okay, maybe one one final comment is that. What's also kind of amusing is that um, this, this replica trick for random tensor networks is actually really closely analogous to computations that uh, people in quantum field theory and in quantum gravity actually do to, uh, to compute this Ryutakyanagi formula in gravity. It's also, its derivation is actually 
quite similar to the derivation that I, uh, or it, it has certain interesting an analogies to the derivation that I, I sketched here for random sensor networks. Well, let's thank Frank again. <laughs>